Praise you, praise you, Lord. Thank you that you're always there, Father. Mark, we have just a bit? Yes. Father, you know us all of your children inside of Al and out. You know the things that are in us that resist you, that we're not even aware of. Father God, I'm asking, Lord, that you do just that breakthrough. You're the God of the breakthrough. <laughs> so we surrender. Help us to just lay every conceivable thing that that we think or we've learned and help us to find you new today to what you're saying to us today help us to hear it and help us to delight your heart by receiving it as our own and let it be life to us and be help us to be life back to you father god we just pray that father god in the glorious name of jesus that we may glorify him and be your light on all the earth the salt and light. Help us to do that, Father God. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Father God. Are you guys ready to, to go deeper into the Word today? Amen. Yes. yes. <clears throat> yes. I'm always rem uh, uh, a little reticent to back up much because of the fact that I want to press forward. As I was going over last week's message in preparation for this week's, uh, I felt like the last two things that I brought up, the last little bit that I mentioned, needed to have, be, the point needed to be driven a little bit further before we went further. So we're going to do that. <clears throat> Uh, last week we were talking about living in the light of true grace. Uh, we've been talking about walking in the light as children of light, that we departed from darkness once we were darkness, now we are light in the Lord. We've been talking about these things. But last week we were looking at it more from the perspective of the grace of God, His influence in our heart. How does it lead us? If we're going to walk in the light, well then we need to walk in the light as... Influenced by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. No one, even though we are in ourselves light, we still are working through a soul that's not completely His. It is His by right of ownership, yes. Yes. but it is not yet all His by right of surrender. Yes. Amen? Yes. We're learning to surrender. No true child of God wants to actively resist Him with eyes wide open. Amen. That does not mean we do not want to actively resist him sometimes. It just means if our eyes were fully opened, we would never want to do it. Amen? Amen. If you're truly his. Um, that having been said, there are times when our eyes are far more closed than they ought to be. And even though we know that we're resisting him, we do it on purpose. But it's only because we don't see him as he really is. Because yeah. if we understood who we were dealing with, we would never do that. Amen? Yes. And it's really not in the heart of the child of God to resist him. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Isn't it the truth? Amen. But last week we were talking about walking or living in the light of true grace. And we had run across, and the Lord brought to my heart to look at Titus that tells us what grace does in fact teach. And it does teach us, right? Because, and, because again, grace is not this... this uh, uh, transcendental uh, um, power that God shunts into our life that magically fixes everything like a spiritual form of pixie dust yeah. like it has often been taught in the past but in reality is just his influence now there are ways in which in the in the Greek language grace could be understood as God's power but the way even it when it's his power it's still administered to us through his influence so you can't get away from relational aspect of salvation in any regard. It's impossible. If it is the true gospel of Jesus Christ, if it really is um, uh, the, the salvation and the redemption that he has offered, then relationship and intimacy and surrender and trust are at the core of it all. And if at any one point you divorce yourself from intimacy, from reliance, from surrender, then you are now preaching a gospel that is foreign to Christ. 
Amen? Yes. So, I mean, that, so even if God grace, God's grace does come in at times and supplies power, yes. it is only done through his direct influence, which requires surrender. Because you're not, how many people realize that you're not going to hear the advice of a person if your pride is too high? Right? That, that You do realize that's what it really means when the scripture says God resists the proud but gives grace. Yeah, right. Gives influence to the humble. Yeah. He's not saying that God would not be willing to give grace to someone that's not humble, but it would do no good. He'd be casting his pearls before swine because they wouldn't hear it in the first place. Right? Yes. The prideful can't be influenced. They're too busy trying to be one. Yeah. They think they know it all. Sometimes I think I know it all. What about you? Uh -huh. You know, I mean, I, no, I mean, intellectually I know better. But sometimes I act like I know it all. Yeah. Right? And, and, and at that point I've cut myself off from God's grace. Not because God's standing in court and saying, well, I don't want to talk to you because you won't talk to me. No, 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 no. You've just made yourself, you've cut yourself off. Your pride has built up a wall between God so that you won't listen to him. It's the truth. Yes. Right? Yes. So when the grace of God comes, even if it does offer strength, it requires surrender. And surrender requires trust. You're not going to surrender in vulnerability to someone that you don't truly trust. And you're not going to do that with someone you don't truly know. Intimacy is at the core of grace. You know, we, we like to teach a gospel that's very, very clean and, 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 and sterile and, and, and surgical and, and, you know, it's a nice, sterile, clean environment where you can add plus, one plus one and always come up with two. And there's always this certainty principle that's involved. And the truth of the matter is, it's relationship. And so it's far more messy than that. Yes. It is. Yes. It, it doesn't work that way. But the way it really works is God comes in and, and reveals who he is. And essentially, God is constantly taking a step closer to you and saying, now, don't be offended at me. And for the next moment or 20 years, you will work through not being offended at that revelation. And as soon as you have worked through that and have surrendered in trust to it, he can take another step towards you because by surrender, you've taken another step towards him. If you'll draw near to him, he will. Draw near to you. That's right. Absolutely. See, this, you see how this works? All of this is relational to its very core. To its very core, it's relational. And so when we live in the light of true grace, grace actually teaches us something because that's really what the most profound type of teaching is more um, uh, learned than spoken. Yes. It's more caught than taught. Right? Yes. Some of the most profound learning you will ever do is in an apprenticeship where you learn by example and doing alongside of, not in a classroom where someone's just teaching at you. This is a good format. The Bible said that uh, God has chosen, in fact, it pleased him that through the, through the foolishness of the message preached to bring salvation. Because really, it is foolish. Classroom settings are pretty stupid, really. They really are. It's not tactile. It's not involved. It's not learning through an apprenticeship. It's sitting down and learning something in a completely non-human way. Humans learn by doing. We learn by getting our hands dirty. We learn by slamming the hammer on our finger a few times and we learn, oh, that's not how you do this. Amen. That's how we learn. And God knew that. Which is why God is always, you know, I, I have this one audio book. It's called um, Skeleton Rattle Your Moldy Leg. Uh, it's, a, it's a great little um, uh, short novel. And, uh, and in it, there's a detective who has been hired in a uh, almost, not entirely, almost all men uh, uh, retirement home to go in and investigate a murder. And, of course, he's interviewing the various people that live there. And uh, one of the people that he was interviewing is a person who has, a, uh, has his, um, his guard up and he he's, was an actor in the past. And um, so he's always in, in, in character and uh, he always played the bad guy, and uh, so he was he, he was in he was in full uh, uh, character as he was interviewing him, and he realized I'm not interviewing this person; I'm interviewing a movie character, uh, the a fictitious mask he's wearing. And so, um, in his interview, 
he did something and said something uh, that the actor, and he did it, he says the reason why I did it is because it was something he wasn't expecting, and it threw him off his game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, God does this with us. You know, uh, he, he knows you well enough to know that you have a mask on, and sometimes they'll come at you at an angle that throws your mask off. Yes. Because it's not what you were expecting. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, so God, it delighted God that through the foolishness, and he says it's foolish, of the message preached to bring salvation. Yes. To those who decide to believe it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because God already knows it's really kind of foolish. Mm -hmm. Teaching from a lector at people is not natural. <laughs> it's not what human beings learn. And, of course, that's how we've structured our entire learning system, uh, which is also profoundly stupid. Uh, which is also why you have people graduating that don't know what life is about and don't, they can be masters in knowing about a subject but not have any idea how to implement it because they were not, they were not, uh, um, they were not in an apprenticeship where they learn by example, they learn from a book, right? And uh, so therefore there's no wisdom, there's just a little bit, there's not any practical knowledge, there's just a little bit of knowledge there. So, but, uh, but to, Grace, I'm sorry? They need to attend the College of Hard Knocks. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. Oh, and, and they will. They will. Be sure of that. <laughs> they will run into the school of hard knocks. We all do. Um, but, you know, but grace, therefore, when it comes and it teaches us, it does what the teacher, like myself, cannot do. It will come in. And now I can do this on a relational level outside of this format here. This format, I'm yakking at you. And the Holy Spirit is able to take together with the words that I say that he's inspiring and create inside of your heart understanding when you can grab a hold of it. But still, it won't be yours until, like we said earlier when we were talking during prayer request time about the joy of the Lord being our strength, uh, that it's not going to be something you own and can appropriate until you own it for yourself. All I did was just kind of create a handshake between you and the only real teacher, amen, uh, concerning a particular subject. Nothing more than that. Now, that having been said, grace has got the ability to come in and radically cause you to understand things you did not understand before. Thank you, God. Amen. Oh, it man. influences you because there's a relational aspect to it. And what does grace do when it teaches? Grace does teach. Yeah. And when it does teach, the first thing it brings up is that you need to forsake the way you used to live. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't first thing it brings up. You remember that, uh, you know, the Bible tells us, and I keep on bringing this up a lot because it's imperative in this day. You realize that there are seasons, and we're going to maybe address that today if I can get to it, because um, uh, I haven't even started on my notes yet. Um, the, uh, you realize that we have seasons yes. on this planet. Yes. I'm not just talking about fall, winter, you know, uh, summer and spring and all that. I'm talking about we have seasons spiritually. Yes. Paul, when he was writing in the book of Ephesians, and another time when he was writing in the book of Romans, was addressing a particular season that they were in. Had nothing to do with the weather. Had nothing to do with the revolving of the earth around the sun. It had to do with spiritual seasons. There was, you realize that there was, on the appointed time, Jesus was born. There was an appointed day, wasn't there? And there's a season for his being here. And there was an appointed day for him to leave. Right? So there are appointed days and there are seasons. Jesus was here for a little while, right? And then when his season was up, he told them, right? I'm going to leave you, and I'm telling you it's to your advantage. It gets better if I were to go, because if I don't go, then the promised one will not come to you, right? Yes. Another season is coming, yeah. and it's better than the season that's here right now, Amen. right? Yeah. And so there are seasons, and, 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 and in these seasons, the, the grace of God comes in and it teaches us certain things that are appropriate for that season. That are necessary, in fact, for that season. And, uh, and, and one of those things is and that I'm, I, I'm, I try to press with you guys is some of the understandings that run contrary to the deceptions that are going on in the world at this point, particularly in the body of Christ. And, and, and one of those misunderstandings is what grace is and what grace does. Grace teaches us the denying ungodliness. Notice what's the first thing it says out of its mouth. You're accepted in the beloved. We love, 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 love you. We've made it all about you. No, no, no. That's not the first thing grace brings up. Grace does bring that up, by the way. Not that it's all about you, but he, did, but he brings up, I love you. He brings up that you are accepted in the beloved. Grace does bring that up, but it's not the first thing it brings up. 
the first thing it brings up is you need to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. You know, another key verse, the reason I said what I said a moment ago, that we need to hold on to in this season, in this season that we're in, is that the law was until John, but after that, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached. It doesn't mean after John. It means the law was until John showed up. And once John showed up, he began to preach the kingdom of God and ever since then, the kingdom of God has been preached. So if I, you know, there, there's a whole group of people that point to the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of John and say, well, that's all well and good, but that's all Jesus was living under the law and all that is law and that doesn't apply to us. What only applies to us is the stuff the apostles wrote, which they don't realize because they haven't spent enough time to even know their scriptures because people in today's world are illiterate concerning the scriptures that what... Peter, James, John, and Paul taught were the words of Jesus. Amen. And the only reason in, in common sense would tell you this, that you realize that the Gospels that told us what Jesus preached didn't get published or written until after Jesus had died and rose again. So if his words have no bearing on us, why write the book? His words have no bearing on us. Right? Why write the dumb book? If only what matters is what Paul and James and John and Peter say, and what Jesus said is passe because it was all law, why bother telling us what Jesus said? It wasn't spoken to you. It has nothing to do with you. Clearly, it does have something to do with you. Do you realize the reason why, and I know this firsthand because I've talked to people uh, who are of that, that mindset, one of the reasons why, what, it, it's not an actual understanding of Scripture, of course, that led them to this conclusion, it's certain verses that didn't fit inside their grace paradigm. When Jesus said, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you, that is not a grace doctrine to them. Because all my sins are already forgiven. I don't even have to ask for forgiveness. They're already forgiven. As soon as I come to Jesus, they're all already forgiven. So that phrase that Jesus said was clearly Old Testament has got nothing to do with me. You see what I'm saying? You see, they came to the conclusion because they're already stuck in a wrong theological paradigm, not because they've studied it to find out if it's true or not. You understand what I mean? Their paradigm created their understanding and interpretation of Scripture. We've done the exact same thing, by the way. Right? And so we have to be very careful to love the truth more than we love our own opinion. Amen? That I want to know truth and I want to know the face of God, even if it offends me. Which brings us back to God introducing himself. Here I am. I'm revealing a part of who I am to you. Decide whether you're going to be offended or not. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who are not offended by me. You realize he said that? Yes, he did. Right? In other words, blessed are those who just get over themselves and just take me for who I am. Because guess what? I'm not changing. Right? Hallelujah. So, amen. Yeah. Now, now, you and I, we're changing also. Hallelujah. Right? Yes. But he does not. He does not. I am the Lord God, I change not. Amen. Which, by the way, is why we're not destroyed, right? <laughs> so, uh, yes, dear. Before you go on to something else, I'd like to interject when you talk about the seasons of our life and when Jesus said, you know, that he was going away, mm -hmm. but it's to my advantage that you're going away, mm -hmm. I'm not going away. The disciples didn't see it like that. Of course they didn't, no. Yeah, they were at that season, they wanted it to continue. Yeah, because we don't, we resist it. change. And it's scary mm -hmm. for another season to come because they're not in it yet. They don't know. It's not familiar yet. It's not familiar yet. But we will always find ourselves going back to the familiar. Yeah. Right? I mean, and that's always, that is true. Remember, I mean, the, one of the classic gospel examples of that is when Jesus died between the death and the resurrection, or actually after his resurrection, where were the disciples? They went back to fishing. That's yeah. what they did. Yeah. They went back to the familiar. They're like, well, they've been walking with the Lord for three years. Yeah, but for like 20 years before that, they were fishers. And that's what they did. Right? So, I mean, they went back to the familiar. They went back to what was normal. What else are we going to do? Well, I guess we'll go fishing. That's what we always have done. Right? Yeah. You go back to the familiar. You retreat to what is familiar to you. But grace, when it comes, you remember Jesus, when he preached, he, you know, he did pre pre preach repentance. So did John. Right? Yes. Well, what, what was essentially the gospel of John in a nutshell? He said, repent and be baptized because the kingdom of God is at the very door. 
It's about to burst onto this world. So repent and be baptized. Right? Yes. Change your mind and be baptized. Right? And when he said change your mind, it was about a lot of things. It did involve changing your mind in regard to sin, but it also meant change your mind in regard to what you thought the Messiah was going to be when he showed up. Or you're going to miss it. Right? Because really that's what repent means, is change the mind. Right? So, grace. So we ended last week with two examples of modern Christianity being taught and lived in the dark and not in the light of God's grace. Two examples. They were, one of them was uh, Hillsong's new... Uh, New York campus church trying to be gay welcoming without being gay affirming and attempting thereby to sidestep the sticky issue of compromising their convictions because they stand by their convictions that gay marriage is wrong or gay relationship is wrong. And it's, 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 in fact, their, their, their stated and on paper convictions are that anything outside of Christian heterosexual marriage is sin. But they want to be gay welcoming. Well, you can't do that. You can't welcome people into something that is adverse to what you're saying. That would be like the KKK trying to be black welcoming. Hello? I mean, it, it, when you say that, it, 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 it strikes your thinking. You're like, well, wait, that doesn't even make sense. You, you can't be black welcoming and be part of the KKK. I'm sorry, those two are adverse to one another. Hello, yes, you got it. There it is, right there. Yes, you cannot bring the world in and be a Christian church. No, I'm sorry, you, you, you can't do that. Who are they trying to change? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. ultimately, in order to be welcoming, you're going to have to be doing the one, be the one doing the changing. They're not going to be doing the changing. You're going to have to change. Because the reason why they haven't been there is because they don't feel welcome. And the reason why they don't, they don't feel welcome is not because they've heard you preach messages on Sunday against homosexuality. They haven't been attending your church. The reason why they don't feel like accepted there is because of the fact that there's light there. And they're repulsed by it. They love, what did John 3 tell us? Men love their darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. That's why they don't feel welcome. It's not because you're not preaching it right. It's not because you're not being kind or loving necessarily. Chances are if you were nasty or kind, they would have no direct knowledge of that. They've never been at your church. Hello? In order to get them to come in and feel welcome, you're going to have to go out of your way to make sure they understand, hey, we want you guys in here. And by the way, you don't have to change to come. Right? You understand? Yeah. And of course, you know, and there's ways in which that sounds great because we, we and this is another little problem is, you know, you, you don't have, the idea that you don't have to change to come to Christ is both right and wrong. It's both right and wrong. You're right. I can't change how I act until I come to him. But I have to change my thinking and my purpose before I do. Or I won't come. The very fact that you chose to come, something changed. Right? Yes. Didn't you have to change your thinking? Yes. Or you would have already been with Christ. Something had to change in the way you thought, in the way you process things, to make the decision, I will now follow Christ because I wasn't following him before. Clearly, something changed here. Right? Yes. So, yes, did something have to change? Absolutely, it did. And once you came, something definitely has to change or you haven't come at all. James makes that very clear. He says, you know, do you want... He said, you know, you say that you have uh, works apart from faith, and I say that I'll prove you by faith by my works. He said, but do you want to know, O oh foolish one, that faith without corresponding action isn't faith at all? If you claim that you've come to Christ and your life hasn't changed, guess what? You haven't come to Christ. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, that's right. It's the truth, right? Yeah. So you can't invite somebody in under the false pretense of, you know, why well, you don't have to change. Because, number one, Jesus doesn't actually even do that. But if, if, if anybody was going to, it would be Jesus. The church is not Jesus. Hello? Yes. This assembly? We're not Jesus. <laughs> I know. Shock, right? We're not Jesus. We're followers of him. We introduce people to him, but we're not him. So if Jesus tells a person, come and follow me, and you'll change as you follow me, that's fine. That's Jesus' deal. My job is not like that. Are you following? I'm not inviting them. Our whole point is 
as a church is to grow up and mature sheep to go out and do the work of the gospel. We are not in the business as a church of turning wolves into sheep. That's not our job. That's not the job of this assembly here. It's your job when you walk out those doors. It's not the job or the purpose of this assembly. The world knows this. The, you realize that, again, have I, how many times have I quoted this to you from the Bible? That the world, that the, the, the children of, of darkness are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. And it's the truth. Mm -hmm. They are wiser in their generation than the children of light. I'll give you an example of it. If, uh, um, if I am a, a, a tree hugger, a global warmerist, and uh, I am trying to, uh, to promote my cause... I am not going to make meetings that are, um, that are uh, where I play down the importance of being green and play down the importance of, of um, not littering and, and carbon thumbprints. I'm not going to have meetings where I play that down. Uh, when I have a meeting, I'm inviting people who are my own and indoctrinating them and then sending them out to have rallies and to influence their, uh, their co-workers and to influence their bosses and say, hey, couldn't we consider making our workplace a green workplace? Or something? You see, what, see how the world does it? The world does not involve, invite naysayers into their meetings to try to indoctrinate them. What they do is they invite like-minded people into their meetings, indoctrinate them, give them the tools to do their job, and send them out Amen. into the highways and the byways to share their gospel. Amen. They're following the model that Jesus made. The church is saying, come in here, wolves, because the best place to make sheep is by inviting wolves into the sheepfold. We all know that. That's common sense. The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Yeah. We're idiots. We do some of the dumbest things yeah. in the idea of thinking that we're doing something smart. Yeah. Uh, can, I mean, see, do you see how what I'm doing here is I'm showing you a real world example and you can see how stupid that is. But someone can tell you we need to become seeker friendly. We need to, you know, make people feel comfortable in our church because how are these poor people going to get saved if they feel uncomfortable around us? And they could sell that. It's being sold across pulpits all around the world. But if I were to change it from a religious setting and turn it into a global warmless warmest meeting or tree hugging meeting, all of a sudden you understand how stupid that sounds. Or turn it into a KKK meeting inviting black people to feel welcome and please have all the free punch and cookies you'd like. Take a seat over there. We're gonna the meeting's gonna start in a minute. Sounds absolutely ludicrous. But you try to sell the same thing in a church and people will buy it that quick. All those yeah, yeah, drove them out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can imagine that the, the, there'd be lots of room left over. Yes, that's right. Lots of room left over. But uh, so anyway, I, I just I kind of skipped over a lot of stuff right there. The second example that I, 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 well, let me go ahead and give you. I also had a slide that was somehow associated with this. Because um, I'm not, don't have any real connection with my notes at the moment. Um, you cannot be friendly with the world without becoming friendly with what they do. It's pretty hard, yeah. You cannot become friendly with the world without becoming friendly with what they do. And if you don't believe me, look back on your life at times that you've allowed yourself to compromise around people who were not born again or by carnal Christians. Your associated with, association with them and trying to be friendly with them began to lower your morals. You did not begin to raise theirs. If you do not move in that relationship, they will invite you to not come back. It's the truth. The world is uncomfortable around light. And carnal Christians are uncomfortable around light. They just are. You cannot become friendly with the world without becoming friendly with what they do. I put Noah's Ark there because of the fact that he's a clean example of not doing that. He decided, you know, I'm not going to be friendly with the world and what they do. And the rest of us said, thank you, Noah, because we wouldn't be here if you had chosen to be friendly with the world around you. Amen. Right? Yes. It's the truth. 
it may not be an uncomfortable truth, but it is a truth. It will desensitize you to the evil, and rather than being light in a, their darkness, you will be deliberately placing your light under a bushel, under the pretense that its light will somehow still magically affect them. I'll go hang out with them, I'll be around them, and I'll turn down the light on my lamp, I'll put it under a bushel, under the false belief that somehow, even though I've covered up my light, that light will still affect them. No, it won't. You hit it. You hit it. How's it going to affect them? It's not gonna, you're, you're being affected. They're not being affected. In fact, what you're doing is you're, re, you're causing them to revel in the fact that here is someone who appears outwardly to be a good, solid, strong Christian, and they act just like we do. That affirms them in their sin. Now they feel confident in their sin. Very dangerous thing. Make no mistake, your friendship with the world will bring death into your life and cost you your friendship with Christ. I'll say that again, and I'm not kidding you. I'm being very serious. Make no mistake, your friendship with the world will bring death into your life, and it will cost you your friendship with Christ. I didn't say it'll cost you a relationship, but it will cost you your friendship. They're like, well, Brother Mark, I need to see that in Scripture. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Let's look at a few. Someone look up James chapter 4. Who will turn there for me? Thank you, Pam. If you'll turn to James 4, and when I ask you to, if you'll start reading in verse 4, um, who will look up 1 John chapter 2 for me? Thank you, Doris. Okay, so 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to look up 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll give you all of these verses in a little while so you can write them down for your notes. So we're going to consider here the words of James, Paul, and John. Three different apostles um, uh, concerning this thorny issue. Um, the decisions that we make in regarding having friendship with the world have a very heavy price tag. Um, Pam, if you will read James 4, verse 4 through 8. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye, uh, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Stop right there. Did I not tell you that your friendship with the world will cost you your friendship with Christ? That's right. Did I make that up, or is that right there in that That's verse? right there. Go, read that again if you would, then continue to verse 8, please. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world be enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwells, dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Okay. So, Fantastic. God here is saying that if we decide to be friends with the world, the first thing he does is call you an adulteress. Right? Yeah. That's the first thing, that's the first word out of his mouth. You adulteress. Right? Do you not realize that your chumminess with the world is going to cost you my friendship? It's got a high price tag, doesn't it? Oh, right? It goes on, that passage, I just want to point some things out that what she just read. He says, or, or do you think? Or do you think? You adulteress, do you not realize that your friendship the world is going to cost you my friendship? Or do you think that the spirit that dwells in you, um, that... that that um, uh, uh, that uh, that yearns over you and dotes over you yearningly, does so to no avail and for no purpose. Do you know what he connects it with? He connects your friendship with Christ with your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. As we keep on in our studies in Ephesians chapter five, we're going to start seeing. We're not going to get to it today, clearly, um, where he pits being drunk with wine and being filled with the Holy Spirit. That the end game of being influenced by people who are grace gifts in the body of Christ that prepare you for the work of the ministry, 
The end game is walk in the light and be perpetually filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the end game. The goal of people who are pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, so on, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Part of equipping them or fitting them for the ministry is causing them to walk in the light and be filled with the Spirit. Are you following? So no wonder if you stop walking the light and start being friendship with the world, do you not realize that the Spirit, once he points back to you, he points back to you, do you not realize you've got a Holy Spirit in you? How does that, what does that sound like? It sounds a lot like what Paul was asking in 2 Corinthians 13. Do you not know yourselves that Christ is in you? Are you guys hearing these words echoing throughout the pages of the Bible? That's, they're not isolated. I understand he's dealing with a different church, but the words are essentially the same, aren't they? And he's telling me, do you, do you think that the spirit that dwells in you lusts and, and dotes over you and, 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 and desires and craves after you for no reason at all? He craves after you because he knows that there's somebody else out there trying to have dominion over you. And he wants you submitted to Christ. Right? Do you not know yourself that Christ is in you, that the spirit of God dwells in you? Amen? Whoever, therefore, he tells us, wants to be the friend of the world makes God his enemy. But he says, for this reason, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. God will draw near to you if you will just make the decision, you know what, what I have been doing and being adulterous, I'm changing my mind. I'm doing what the gospel of the kingdom teaches me to do. Starting with John, who preached out by the river Jordan, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The rule of Christ is available. Change your mind because you could have Christ ruling over you instead of that demonic spirit. Amen. Change your mind, you adulterers. Speaking of myself, I'm not just talking at you guys. You understand, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. fall in that category like you guys do, just like anyone else. Sometimes I think that when I come across you, I think I'm yakking at you, and I'm also a human. <laughs> so adulterers sometimes applies to Mark too, right? And he says... You adulterers, do you not realize? It's like he's shaking them and pinching them. And, you know, do you not realize? That's the reason why in Ephesians 5, as we keep on reading, he says, Awake, you guys, you guys who are sleeping, and Christ will give you light. You have fallen asleep, right? You adulterers, don't you realize that your friendship with the world is costing you friendship with Christ? Or do you think that the Holy Spirit... So the scripture says in vain that the spirit who's been given to you, who dwells in you, yearns and dopes and craves, um, uh, craves you for no reason. Does it think it says that for no reason? If you will just, but if you will just draw near to God, he will draw near to you. It's a good message. This is good news. It doesn't matter how bad your situation is, how bad you've fallen into the world, how much you have decided to become actually an illicit lover of the world. If you'll just change your mind, God will draw near to you. Where do you think he got that? Well, where do you think he got that idea, James? Well, he, you know, he, he didn't have a Bible to turn to. He couldn't write, he couldn't read the book of James because he hadn't even written it, right? It hadn't been sent yet. He Certainly hadn't been mass published so that the church at large had read it. He just followed the people that were working it before him. He read the, he, he got that from the Old Testament, from what was before him. Absolutely. Um, let me see where I can find it here. In um, the book of Isaiah, if you'll turn there, you can look at it real quickly. In Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In other words, draw near to God. Right? And he will draw near to you. Right? He says, let the wicked change his mind. Forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, the way he's been thinking. Let him turn around to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. <laughs> not, 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 not turn around and then wait and God will decide your case later and get back to you no 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 you already know if you turn around he will have mercy on you Amen. thank you God Amen. isn't that nice yes. 
I mean, you literally have just crawled. I know it's a, a, a gross analogy, and it was meant to be because the visual imagery of it is supposed to repulse you. When you have given into friendship with the world, you are literally crawling out of bed with the body fluids of another lover on you already. And you come to yourself and you realize, what did I just do? I just had an illicit love affair with someone other than my Lord. Yes. 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 Um, when you're talking of like being friendly with the world. Yes. The world would be anybody that the world Lord itself. Ejects God's word. That would even include carnal Christians. More, in fact, more so carnal Christians than even the world. We see that in First Corinthians chapter six. Remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he, told, he began to address them about the man who'd been living with his mother-in-law, having sex with his mother-in-law. And in the second book, he wrote them, he says, you know, when I told you to not keep company with sexually immoral people, I didn't mean the sexually immoral people of the world, because otherwise you'd have to get off the planet. I meant don't keep company with anybody who calls himself a brother who's living that way. So it's all the more if it's a carnal Christian. So would it include, like, somebody, let's just say they're one particular religion or whatever, and they've been taught something, and you've been friends for years or whatever, mm -hmm. but you see their heart slowly changing? That's different. See, they're in the process of changing. See, a person who hates the light will not come to it. So you already know where that person is in their relation to the light. If they are coming to it, if they are softening to it, then that's good ground. But if they are, if they are hard where they are and, and they start giving you the party line of, well, that's your truth. You already know, walk away. Mm -hmm. This is my truth. This, that's your truth. Let's walk in tolerance with one another and just get along. And that's say, okay, already we can't, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I, I support your right to, to believe that. That's fine. God doesn't even make you not believe that. But I can't fellowship with it. Right? right. Like, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I would love to get to know you better, but the truth of the matter is, I, I, this whole thing is a doomed relationship before it gets started because of the fact that you're darkness and I'm light. Yeah. I may not use those words because you're just going to take them off all the more at that point. But you say, you know, we're, we're coming from two different paradigms and this would be like forcing a, a hardcore leftist with a hardcore rightist into the same room and expecting them to be kind to one another. It's not going to work out well. So, uh, you know, let's just part friends, uh, or friendly, I should say, and, uh, you know, have a nice life, you know? It doesn't mean that you don't, if you don't see them in public, you don't say hello to them, you don't continue to try to live Christ in front of them, but you do not commit yourself to a long-lasting, intimate friendship with them. Yes, uh-huh. But let's say there's a person you don't know them on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you belong to the same club on Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know that they're of a different religion. Mm -hmm. But whenever you put things on Facebook about God or whatever, they're loving it or liking mm -hmm. it or oh, whatever. Yeah. I mean, is that still God working in their heart? Possibly. Um, he'll use everything he can. A lot of times people are just going to gravitate to anything they think is positive. Okay. People are going to gravitate to something they think is positive. So if you say something that's affirming, that's great. But I guarantee if you were to write on, on your Facebook page that, you know, uh, God loves homosexuals, but, um, but he hates homosexuality and sin, that, that would get a different response mm -hmm. than saying that God forgives us. Oh, I was going to buy into that one. Sure, even the atheists would say, sure, that's fine. They're not, I mean, they may not believe in God, but they're not going to be up against it necessarily because it's, it's a positive message. See what I'm saying? There's a lot of people in the world that <coughs> like Christian sayings because they're, they're relatively positive. But that doesn't mean that they've had a heart change. It just means they like positive things. They also like flowers and puppies. That doesn't make them Christians. You know what I mean? So. May I ask yeah. a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. Mm -hmm. Therefore, submit to God. Oh, you're. I'm sorry. You're talking about here. Verse yeah, yeah. Well, yes, definitely. Because this was written to Israel. Yeah. So, then yeah, so they were. Why it's so important to particularly 
separate ourselves from the culture. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, clear, clear, in, yeah, yeah, clearly here in Isaiah 55, 7, he's, he's, he's talking to Israel, and everyone in Israel who would have been privy to this message would be someone who was in covenant with God. So, yeah, uh, so clearly, he, and Isaiah was written, of course, to people that were backslidden Israel. So, yeah, so they had been with God and they were being invited to come back. So, yeah, the message. But it also would apply to anybody in the world. They are not coming back, but they're coming to him. If they would just change their mind, clearly yeah, just, they're accepted. Let him turn, not necessarily let him return. Yes, exactly. Let him turn. Let him change his mind, right? You look like you might have something, Gary. No? Okay. All right, so uh, anybody else before we go on? Okay, so who had, um, uh, anyway, let me finish that verse. Uh, Therefore, submit himself to God and resist the devil. You cannot resist the devil and cling to his children. That doesn't even make sense. You know, a lot of the a lot of the gospel is just turning your brain on, reading the verses, and then extrapolating truth from it. Can I be chummy with the devil's children without being chummy with the devil? Well, let's turn it around. Can the world hate God without hating you? No, they can't. To hate one is to hate the other. So, on the other side, to love one is to love the other. If I want to love the children of the world, then I also have to love the devil, their father. Are you following me? Yes. You see, it doesn't take a lot. You just have to turn your brain on long enough to work through the math. It's really not hard. Now, does that mean that you... Now, by love, I'm talking about entering into an agape-type relationship with them. Do you want the best for them? Would you be willing to spend yourself sacrificially on the world even as your Lord did? Yes, and you should. But that's different than entering into a phileo relationship of knowing and trusting the individual. That's the relationship we're talking about in James where it says, whoever wants to be friendly with the world. right? In fact, I actually have those words written into my, my physical Bible as opposed to my electronic version, um, the actual meaning of some of those words, because they are so rife with meaning. Um, the word um, friendship means a relationship of knowing, liking, and trusting. It can mean someone that you are allied with as a, uh, in a cause or struggle, a comrade. The word, um, uh, um, let's see, the word friendship, uh, Likes, I think it is, or it depends on what your translation you're using. Um, friend. Oh, the word friend means, um, yeah, I just read what friend means. Then, um, yeah, friendship. I told you what friendship means. The word friend itself, it says who wants to be a friend of the world. It means fond of and dear to. The word wants, whoever wants to be, the word wants is, means to will deliberately, to have a purpose and be minded. Of, of the will, electing or choosing between two or more things. To choose, I want to be this person's friend. I'm having to choose, whether we realize it or not, you're choosing between being intimate with God or being intimate with the world, according to this passage. He says, because if you're going to be chummy with the world, you cannot be chummy with me. So by wanting, the word wanting means to deliberately choose between two options. Are you always aware that you're choosing between two options? No, it's so bad sometimes that you're not even thinking about Christ at all. You're just thinking about friendship with this person. But be warned, you are choosing between two things. Yeah. Do you follow? Yeah. See, I mean, the enemy's going to pull the wool over our eyes as much as he can to keep us from being sensitized to the decisions we're making. But, we're at, but you know, ignorance, ignorance doesn't change what you reap. You may not have known that what you planted was a cantaloupe seed, but you're going to get a cantaloupe. Why? Because that's what you planted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You may not have realized you were choosing between God and the world, but you were. Yeah. And you'll reap what you planted. Right? Yeah. Whoever sows to this world shall from the world reap corruption. He didn't say now as long as they knew that's what they were doing. No, he didn't say that. Is it, 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 is, it is what it is. What you plant, you're going to reap. It's the way it is. It's not a punishment. It's a result. Right. Yes, uh-huh. How does that apply to being married to an unbeliever? It, it applies in unique ways. You, there, you've already realized being born again, you can only go so far in that relationship. 
there, there, there are levels of intimacy you just cannot achieve. Well, there you have it. That's it right there. I mean, the, the fact that you're holding on to Christ and you're refusing to let go of him, you still try to shine the light to the degree that you can, and you're not capitulating to darkness, you're doing what you can do. But you can only get so close. But, you know, and, 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 but, you know, and this is not intended to encourage you in a negative way, but the truth of the matter is uh, your situation is not all that unique. That same scenario ha is, uh, it occurs almost worse in most Christian marriages. Because you've got, I remember Anthony Campalo used this as an example in one of his messages I, that I really liked. That was before Anthony Campalo drove off the deep end um, he, because of listening to the counsel of his wife. Um, but uh, he was a brilliant uh, preacher. Um, but anyway, he, uh, one of the things he said once was that he was giving the illustration of uh, and probably I think he was quoting from somebody, but I don't remember who it was, but he said, you know, he said, um, he walked alone, she walked alone, they got married, they walked alone together. And he said, well, that's logically impossible. He says, no, not. I see people doing it all the time. She's got her commitment, she's got her desire, she's got her goals, she's got her job, he's got his, and they're married, they're tied at the hip, but they really are living separate lives. Well, that is essentially the same relationship I have with the world. We are tied at the hip in that we're still on the same planet together, and we share in common flesh. But that's pretty much where our similarities end. I got my agendas and my purposes, and I walk in my direction, and they've got theirs. They're not, two one in the they're not one because we're not agreed. You can't be How can two walk together unless they're agreed? It's not. It's right? Side, it's a side note, but it, that's another great example of why God's plan of the wife supporting the husband and not seeking her own life. Career, absolutely. Because as soon as you do that, there's separation. Now, she has become a fundamental provider in the home rather than an aid to the provider. Now you have two heads. Yeah. And that's usually considered, you know, an abnormality, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh-huh. It's almost like in the Roman times when they were tied. Uh, the, the recorder cannot hear you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's almost like in the Roman times when they would tie a dead person. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, to... The living person. Yeah, because they committed murder. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, I hope it does. It seems like it did. Okay, good. I think but, um, asking, is there hope? <laughs> there, there's always hope. Yeah. Oh, there's there's always hope. hope. Until the last breath, there's always hope. Yeah. So anyway, he says, draw near to God, he draws near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you're double-minded. But it started, But before he said that, he said that you're going to have to submit yourself to God and resist the devil. You cannot resist the devil and become chummy with his children. That's right. It's the way it is. It, it, it's, it's, it's completely backwards to think otherwise. Did you follow the logic? Yes or no? Yes. I gave, what illustration did I give you to prove that? What, you tell me. What illustration did I give you to prove you can't be chummy with the devil, uh, chummy with the devil's children without being chummy with the devil? What illustration did I offer you? Proof of that. I quoted something to you. Yeah. See, this is why I go back over things because I'm not sure if you really got it. The example is on the positive end. Always, always pick things that you don't understand with something you do understand. Yeah. What does the Bible say? You cannot claim to love me without loving my children. To love my children is to love me, God says. Well, the same thing is true with the enemy. You cannot claim to love his children without loving him. Are you understanding? Yes. yes. Do you see the comparison here? Yes. They're identical. Are they running in different directions? Yes, but relationships still work the same way. Don't they? Yes. If, if I have children and you decide to be nasty and harmful to my children, I guarantee there's going to be a strain in our relationship. Yeah. I promise you. You will never get closer to me than you could get to my children. If you will not be nice to them, you can't. your nicest to me means nothing. Mm -hmm. It's pretentious. It means nothing. Right? Yeah. See, it's, that's the reason why I know it's not just a spiritual principle that just applies to children of light. It's a relational principle. It applies to everything. So it also applies over here with the devil and his children. I can't be chummy with them without being chummy with him. 
I understand it. It's a relational principle, not just a spiritual principle. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh. So how does that relate to, or is this just a saying, a, another saying from the old, to love, to hate the sin, and love the person, sinner. or to love the person? But to hate, to the hate, the, hate the sin and love the sinner. Yeah, that's what I was addressing a minute ago. And I know I've said a lot, and so it's, you can miss something easily. And I also told I talk fast, which I don't believe. Um, but uh, um, l there's different kinds of love. The Bible addresses many of them. There's not just the typical three. There's actually, I think, five different Greek words for love. One of them is phileo. That's particularly the one he's referring to. You do not want to strike up, because that's a relationship of knowing and liking and trusting. Agape love is to spend yourself on the benefit of another, even if they don't want it, right? Yeah. God so agape the world that he gave his son. And they responded, they loved him so much in response that they killed him, right? Mm -hmm. See, so he was still able to agape them, but he couldn't be their friend, yeah. right? Yeah. Friendship requires common ground. A friend, I forget what this quote comes from. I know I read it from one of John Eldridge's books, but he was quoting from someone else, and I don't know where that's from. But it says, friendship begins the moment you meet someone who sees what you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Friendship begins the moment you find someone or meet someone who sees what you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had friendship with a guy named Brent, who um, uh, they both had a type of, uh, of a career in psychology of some form or another. And they had met over the years. And they struck up a friendship because they were seeing things that the other person saw. There was a connection through the ideas of psychology and what works in relationship and work, what works in the gospel. And the relationship, a friendship was born. Why? Because he met someone who saw what he saw. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, when, so a friendship with the world is born when we share things we agree upon. Yeah. And that's when walking together begins. Yeah. And that's also where danger begins yeah. with the world. You follow? Now we can be agreed about natural stuff that we both agree that sunny days might be better than than rainy days, or that um, I, I like blue more than I like black, or um, you know I, I like America more than I like uh, um, um, a capitalistic uh, society, or I mean I'm sorry, a socialist society, or whatever. You might agree on some natural, you know, I like chicken, I like steak, that kind of thing. That's okay. We're talking about things that really matter, that are at the core of life, the core of connection with God. If you can't agree on those things, then friendship does not exist. Are you following? Yes. There's an association on some level. And you can agree upon a lot of things and have a friendly relationship. But friendship, real, true friendship, it, it, friend, uh, friendship, again, it, it, it's, it's when you are connected with a person who sees what you see. And that friendship will have the depth of whatever you share in common. If all you share in common are political views, you're going to have a rather shallow friendship. It will be a friendship, but it's going to be rather shallow because it's all pertaining to very, very natural things. You have another friend over here that you can get the deep conversation about things that matter in your life and, and loved ones and, and, and children and, 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 um, and aspirations and stuff like that. You can have a relationship with them on that level. And, and you, they see what you see. This person over here doesn't see that stuff. You see how you have different degrees of friendship, right? And it's based on what you both see, right? So can you have a very, very, very common, purely natural relationship with someone in the world? Yes, but it won't be long-lived if you really love the Lord because he's going to come up. He's going to come up. And, when, and that is where the division will begin. And if you are, let me just submit this to you as one other thought. I don't how, care how connected you are on the small issues. If you are in diametric opposite positions on the big issues, the small issues won't hold, be enough to hold you together. Okay? That's exactly. So, um, now that having been said, um, uh, who, uh, uh, Doris, you had First John chapter 2? Uh, I'm going to have you start in verse 14. Let me address this one thing uh, for Pam particularly. There, uh, as I said to you a week or so ago, I think it was last week, it may have been the week before that, there is a specific and a, and a, um, a peculiar paradigm to a child of God who's married to a non-regenerate person that God creates, again, by his influence. His grace enables a type of connection 
that would not be possible just between a typical non-regenerate person and a Christian. Because God wants that influence there. As long as the non-regenerate person still wants you around enough that they still, as the scripture says, are pleased to dwell with you. Don't leave. Because they're set apart for salvation by you. The fact that they have not run away from you indicates they are not absolutely, completely adverse to Christ. Do you follow? Yes. And so there's still hope. Are yes. you following? Thank you. To the degree, but now if it, now you know, as you continue in your growth in Christ, you're going to become more and more light, and that could change the nature of that relationship. You just need to know that. I'm just speaking facts to you. I'm still speaking out of love, wanting to put my arms around you. At the same time, I'm saying it because I have compassion. But I'm just being honest. The closer we get to Christ, the more tension will be put on some of those less deep strings that bind us together. Amen? But you've got something more than just social things holding you together. You do have the grace of God there because of the fact that he told you, stay if they please to dwell with you. And the unbelieving spouse is sanctified and set apart for salvation by the believing spouse. Right? So it's a slightly different relationship because of God's sovereignty. He's got the right to do this. And he's spoken to it. He's over, we don't have to wonder. Kind of like over here. I don't have to wonder that if I turn to him, will he show me mercy? I already know he will because he said, if you'll turn to me, I will show you mercy. Right? And I will abundantly pardon. And he, isn't it important he threw in the word abundant? Yes. Because we needed that. Right? Because, <laughs> you know, the first thing we're going to think is he said he'd pardon, but did he realize I was going to bring this truck with me? Right? He said abundantly. Right? Amen? Yeah, the semi. And the 12 semis behind it. That's all mine, Lord. Um, right? He said, I will abundantly pardon. So he, he threw that in there, but he also, so he threw this in there as well. He made it very clear that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified. If they please to dwell with you, do not go away. Amen? Amen. So, so there's, there's hope Thank at the same you. time. It's Thank a different you. kind of relationship. Yeah. And it's a very good question. The fact that you're thinking it and asking tells me your brain's turned on, which is excellent. Yeah. It's a good question. No, I'm serious. It's a, it's a good question because a lot of people would never even consider it. I understand not everybody's in that position, but the point is you're thinking, and that's yeah. good. Okay, Doris, I'm sorry. It's in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 14 through 20. 14 through 20. I have written unto you fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard and that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all, all of us. But you have an option from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now this passage is ripe because it says a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The first thing he tells us is that I'm writing to you fathers because you've already in intimacy known the Father. And I've written to you young men because you've, you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have already overcome. That means you're not chummy with. You've overcome the wicked one. Right? Mm -hmm. In other words, a lot. In other words... He's qualifying the kind of audience he could write these things to. He couldn't write it to just anybody. I'm writing to you because, right, you fathers, because you have known the father who's from the beginning. I've written to you young men. Notice who's he addressing. The males. The heads. Right? You young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Right? I've, this is why I'm writing you. Because you're already well on your way. You have intimacy with the Father. The fathers have intimacy with the Father. And the young men have overcome. Amen? Wow, what a wonderful place. Amen? They're already on a good running start, aren't they? And he says, do not love the world. Now, you wouldn't think you'd have to say that to this kind of a group. So, But they're still human. Right? So, you know, so if you're not 
in one of those two positions, all the more it needs to be said to you. Yes. Would you not agree? Yes. If it has to be someone it's said to someone who knows intimately the Father and has overcome the world, how much more to those who are struggling with the world yeah. and only know Him partially? Yeah. Right? Yeah. How much more? <laughs> right? So He says... Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he tells you why. The reason why is because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, which, by the way, are the three sins that address them in the garden. Right? Yeah. Those are the three sins that address them in the garden. Think through it. Yeah. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh was... And he's mine. So he's holding back on us, is what you're saying. I'm not allowed to eat that fruit because if I did, I'd be like him. Pride of the flesh. But it looked good for food, lust of the eyes. Right? The pride of life. All these things are directly connected to the things that they did there. Right? Yeah. All sins pretty much fall out of these categories. And he says, they're not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is on a, on a pathway leading towards destruction and the lust of it. But whoever does the will of God will abide forever. Amen? Yes. And now there's more to the verse, but those are the main important points. Now I'm going to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And why am I reading this to you? Because I start off by telling you that you cannot be friendly with the world without becoming friendly with what they do. Right? And that that friendship with the world will cost you your friendship with Christ. Now I've not already illustrated that at least twice now with two different verses. Now we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And you know what? I, I don't really care what other ministers say. I don't even really care what I say if it doesn't back, if not backed up by this. Yeah. Are you following? Yeah. So I don't care who tells you. This is why Paul said in the chapter that we've been dealing with that we haven't even hardly visited today in Ephesians 5, which is the reason why we're reading these other passages, is pointing back to what he says in Ephesians 5. He says, don't let someone, some goofball from a pulpit deceive you with empty words. It's because of loving the world that the wrath of God is coming on the children of disobedience. So don't be a partaker with them. Amen. Amen. He's warning you, don't be deceived because there's people telling you you can do this and it won't cost you. And I'm telling you, it's a lie. I was going to say it's a lie. <laughs> God, I wish I could say that strongly enough, but there's just no way to do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14, reading through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That's essentially what it said over there in the first one we read. In James, because the word friendship means to be yoked together in a common cause. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because what kind of fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? He's, he's calling, he's, what he's doing, again, Paul's letters does a lot of this with people. What are you thinking? <laughs> Poor Paul. He loved these people so much, but he was constantly in the state of, would you please turn your brain on? <laughs> right? Think through this. What could you possibly have in common with them? So why would you want this affiliation? Why would you want to be gay welcoming? What could you possibly have in common with them? Hello? Yes. Why would you even want to do this? Really? Yeah, you're right, because you're going to become more like them. Yeah. What's the phrase? You cannot be friendly with the world without becoming friendly with what they do. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Well, it can't have communion, can it? No. If light comes in, darkness leaves. Right? right? You, can't yeah. have both. you can't have both. And when we, and I keep on referring back to it. And John chapter 3 is so clear on this issue. It says that the light, he says it, that um, when Jesus Christ, God so loved the world that he said, gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Because he, God did not send his world into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men have loved their darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. God did not condemn the world. They were already condemned, weren't they? Amen. 
And why are they condemned? Because they love their darkness. And they will not come to the light. It says they hate the light because their deeds are evil. So the only way you can have fellowship as a child of light with a person in darkness is to turn down the light. Because they won't fellow. They're true to their God. They won't fellowship with you as long as you're shining in light. They, they are committed. They are dedicated. They've allowed the desire of their father to own their heart. It's what they want. What did Jesus say? He said, the reason why you can't listen to my words is because you're of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. You have a proper relationship with your father. You want to do his bidding. My children want to do my bidding. The problem is, it doesn't always work that way on the light because we want to, we want to be friends with them. So we'll turn down our light just enough to try to have friendship with them. And then we have the nerve to act surprise five years, ten years, twenty years later that our relationship with God used to be so much more intimate than it is now. Why is that? Well, figure it out. This isn't rocket science. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the book. Um, it was like the, the last party he had. I just spent the time talking to Christians, mm -hmm. and he's never called me back. Yeah, it'll separate you. Yeah, it automatically will. Yeah, right? you don't. You don't. You don't even have to try to separate yourself from darkness. Just shine your light. It'll take yeah, care of itself. Yeah. It will take care of itself. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. With believers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Believers who are carnal are going to respond stronger than the world because they're fighting battles on two fronts. Mm -hmm. The unbelievers just fighting it on one front. The believer is fighting it on two. They got a tug of war going on inside, and you just added to it. They're going to react a whole lot more hostile than even the world does sometimes. Right? So it says. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, for, these, for the reason of all the things I've just said... Come out from among them and be separate from them, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. A reference directly to where? Leviticus. Leviticus. And touch not what is unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. But you're going to have to make a decision what friendship you want. Because you cannot have both. The person who wants, remember that Greek word wants, whoever wants to be the friend of the world, that wants me that they made the decision between two things. If you choose the world, you are choosing against Christ. Period. There are no two ways about it. Now, I did not even hardly touch what I wanted to go into today, and I guess that's okay. Um, I will give you the, remind you of the second example, and that was of that pastor who had a graphic posted on his Facebook page with cartoon illustrations of various distorted um, distortions of normal heterosexual lifestyles. It would have like a little stick figure of a man and a man holding hands, or a man, a man, and a woman holding hands, or all kinds of distortions of, of godly marriage. And it sa and said um, essentially that... Uh, um, all of these are in the Bible, so they are all affirmed by God. No, no. Well, that's what he said, though. That didn't make him right. I'm just saying that's what he said, uh, says right on the post. You know, now, following this pastor's logic, murder is also mentioned in the Bible. Rape, theft, slander, lying. And because it's mentioned, therefore, it must be okay. Regardless what it says. Yeah, yeah, yeah the context means nothing, clearly. Yeah, of course it mentions homosexual uh, relationships in the Bible. But does it ever affirm them as being okay? No. But it does mention them. Does it mention uh, multiple people in one marriage? Oh, yes. It mentions that. 
Sure it does. It mentions um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, young men sleeping with their mother-in-law. Does that make it okay? No. <coughs> but it has mentioned it. But he was trying to play it off as because it's in the scriptures, it's scripture role. Well, so is murder, therefore. So is theft. So is rape. So is all kinds of other heinous things, right? Sorry, no. Just because the Bible mentioned it does not mean that it affirms it. <laughs> Even that church that is, is so backwards in their morals, um, Hillsong, um, in that one expression in New York, um, understands that. They understand, well, you know, I can't be gay affirming, but I do want to be welcoming. They at least understand you shouldn't be affirming. But, of course, they don't realize that by, by, by being welcoming, you are affirming. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's painting a false picture of Christ. You can come into Christ and not change. You can fellowship with this church, which by extension is him. He's the head, we're the body. Can the body do something that the head's not part of? No! <laughs> you know, if I were to leave this room and walk downstairs, my head's going to come with me. It sure is. <laughs> Believe it or not. It better. Now, I, I know that I don't always act like my head's with me, but it will go with me, right? If Christ will not do this, and yet we try to unilaterally make a decision to do it, then we disease the body. Don't we? If you cannot invite a non regenerate person into Christ as they are, remaining as they are, then they shall not and they should not come inside the body that way either. And if you are shining your light as you ought to be shining your light, they wouldn't want to come. Because, again, John 3, the world hates the light because their deeds are are evil. Now, if they're wanting to change their actions, if they realize what it's doing in their life and they are stuck in this thing and they hate that it has power over them and they're looking for a way out, we're not having the same, that's not the same conversation. That's like what you were talking about earlier. That person wants to come out. Great. We can talk about this. But a person who just wants to come in and fellowship among you and not change, I'm sorry, there's not a seat for you here. Right? And the truth is, if you're walking in the light as you ought to be walking in the light, they wouldn't be comfortable with you anyway. That's right. So, anyway, we're going to have to end there. Um, uh, that, a lot of that is really just a, a reprint of last week, only adding elements to it. But there again, I, that's what I felt I needed to start with anyway. So that obviously was all it was supposed to be. So we'll end with that. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions or thoughts before we close in prayer? Yes, Terry. Getting it into the right words. Um, again, just recognizing, and I shared with you earlier this week about something that I began to see, just again, confronted with another TV show that threw a really bad homosexual scene in the middle of it, and I had to turn it off. And, um, but just, again, recognizing how, how, I think a lot of the reason that some people are allowing homosexual in is because the same light that is trying to point on them is pointing back on themselves. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to let go of... Their pet sin. Their pet sin. Mm -hmm. That's and true. the same is true. You know, How can like, I condemn them if I'm acting know, this way? This isn't just those people out there. We all have it even in here. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we've allowed ourselves to put up with things and tolerate things in our lives mm -hmm. that we need to be as... Um, offended at yes, as we are at those other things that we've been talking about. I agree with you absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the uh, something that uh, that brings up an issue <laughs> that needs to be addressed in the short. We really don't have any time now, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, there, there's a difference between things that you are aware of and things that you're not aware of. Uh, a child of God. It's not going to be aware of everything that they're doing wrong. It's not possible. Uh, number one, God hasn't even revealed most of it to you. The truth of the matter is, if, if we were to in a moment see the ridiculous and infinite gap between my character and Christ's, we would be defeated instantly. Yeah. Yes, we, would, we would claim there's no hope. Yeah. We would. 
And God's too good to allow us to see that because the fact that he wants you to believe that he really can do this. Because he, he sees the gap and says, oh, I can do that. Right? Because he's God. If you saw the gap, you would crumble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, so, yeah, thank you, Lord. And we have a provision by the blood of Christ to cover us for all the things. Because whether you know it's wrong or not, it still offends God. Yes. You know what I mean? Just because you don't know it doesn't mean he doesn't. <laughs> doesn't mean he approves of it. The Bible in 1 John chapter 1, when you get to 9, it deals with sins that you know you committed and you need to confess them. But then there's a verse earlier, I think it's in 7, it may be earlier or later, I don't know. But anyway, in 7 I think it is, where it says, but if we walk in the light, is he in the light? Is in the light. In other words, if we walk in the light of what we know, right? then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all the dumb things that we do that we don't realize we're doing. Now, I understand that in the, in the, in the English translation it says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Which, if you read the verse, makes no sense in English. It makes no sense. If I'm walking in the light, then I'm not committing any sins to be forgiven. Right. So the verse makes no sense in English at all. None. Zero. But if you look in the Hebrew, it makes perfect sense. It literally, in the Hebrew, this is the way it reads. If you walk in what you know to do, in the same way that Christ walked in what he knew to do, then we have fellowship, koinonia, with him, and his blood covers us for all the dumb things we do we don't realize we're doing. All the things that are outside of the light that we don't know, right? But if you just walk in the light of what you do know, the stuff, the copious amount of things you don't know, his blood covers, right? Thank you, Lord. So the blood of Jesus Christ does more than just forgive me for known sin. It covers me for the, the, because that's really, that's the small things. Because what I know is small in comparison to what I don't know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But the mountains of things that I don't know, that I offend regularly, are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't even have to be confessed because I don't know them. I don't even know to confess them. They're not sin to me because I don't know. Right? Yeah. They're still wrong but they're not sin, right? And his blood just covers that. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Isn't he gracious? Yes, he is. Now, I say that because of the fact that <clears throat> one of the arguments that the world will use against you is a distortion of Terry's argument. Terry's argument is right in that we as individuals sometimes allow ourselves the privilege of secret sins. And that is no different well, it is, in fact, different than the world because it's worse. The world is in sin because that's their dad. They're supposed to, they're just being loyal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're being disloyal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a huge difference. And it is uh, a contradiction to, uh, to say uh, that we can't fellowship with you because your particular variety of sin is different than my particular variety of sin. That is hypocritical. You understand? Which is why we're talking about walking in the light. Walking in the light doesn't make provisions for sin. In fact, at the very end of chapter 5, he tells us, and make no provision for the lost of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Make no, stop making provisions for it. Because if you keep on making provisions for it, you're not walking in the light. Right? right. So it's a very good and cogent point. But the problem is the world will point at the church and say, well, I know that they do things wrong. And you know what? The world might actually know that you're doing something wrong that you don't even know is wrong. Mm -hmm. So they might be right in that regard, but it's not sin to you. See, but the world is always going to look to point a finger at you and put a, a, a darkness on your light. They're always going to look to do that. Always. Uh, you know, you also can have, you know, someone who was like a Billy Graham, who every once in a while might have lost his cool with someone. Because he was a human. But that didn't mean that was his habit of life. And the one person who was not born again, who saw him lost his cool, lose his cool, is not going to pay attention to the history of this man. He's going to pay attention to this one event because it gives him a license to sin. That's right. Don't feel bad about that. I'm telling you, don't feel bad about that. It gives him an excuse. And he has to try to come up yes. with that answer. Yes, but I'm telling you, don't feel bad about that. If you do something stupid in front of the world, if you sin in front of the world, yes, you should repent over that. But that is not making anybody go to hell. 
That's not making anybody choose against Christ. They used that to choose against Christ because they wanted an excuse. They were looking for one. And if you had not provided one, they'd have found one someplace else. They already had one because they already hadn't come to Christ. Before you made that mistake, before you sinned, they'd already made a decision to not follow Christ, which is why they weren't following Christ when they saw you do that. Don't wear the guilt of that. You are not responsible for another person's eternal commitment. Are you following? Yes. You're not responsible. God says those people who split hell wide open have no excuse just because of creation itself. This is not a relationship with you. It's a relationship with Jesus. Are you following? Yeah. Now, should you be pointing a clear picture of him? Yes. Are you going to mar that image from time to time? Even when you're walking in the light? Yes, you will. Because you're not perfect. Big news flash. Right? Yeah. But that's not keeping anybody in the world. I got news for you. A person who wants God will find him. A seeker will find. Amen. Seekers don't stay seekers long if they're true, genuine seekers. That's why I don't buy it when someone says, well, I've been searching for God for years. I'm like, well, no, you haven't been. Yes. You're lying to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least lying to me. But you're lying. Yeah. Because if someone seeks, they'd find. Yeah. If you claim that you've been seeking for years and have not found God, then you just told me, if what you're saying is true, then what God said isn't true. Who says that he's given his life to every man who comes into the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think I'll trust God's word more than yours. You might think you've been searching, but you have not been searching. You've been searching for a caricature that you want to be, that you want to exist. I'm looking for a God that's gay affirming. Oh, okay, well, then now I understand you've been searching and you haven't found. That makes perfect sense. Right? Yeah. But, it, but if you're saying you're searching for God, for the real one, regardless of what he's like, I'm looking for God, I want to find him, and you haven't, then you really haven't been searching for him. You're lying. You're at least lying to yourself, if not to me. Right? It's the truth. 